Hey everybody, P.D.A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show with one of our very favorite guests. Even as I'm saying it now, I'm smiling. I, uh, I adore Hilliard Guest. He is a friend of mine and he's become a friend because of the show and he often listens. So, hey, Hilliard, what up? You know, I love you. So we talk about a little bit of a challenging topic. So, okay, back up for a second. Uh, Hilliard and some of his peers wrote an open letter basically to the Hollywood industry and companies like Hulu and Amazon and Netflix and HBO, all these companies are like, well, it's time for change. Well, so Hilliard, who vice chairs the Writers Guild of America's West Committee of Black Writers, gathered with vice chair Bianca Sams and co-chair Michelle Amore, and they wrote a letter to Hollywood saying, all right, we believe you. You're all the biggest production houses in the business. Start hiring black folks in front of the camera, behind the camera, and as screenwriters. And if they're already working there, start promoting them. And Hilliard goes into detail. And this is what I love about this show is that we can talk about the racial part of this with actual actionable things. Like you're an industry, you're not representing properly. By the way, they cite the the most recent study from UCLA that looks at representation in the entertainment business and, and how they are doing with black folks. And it's not up to the standard. And so they're just calling it out. And Hilliard and I have a great conversation about what it is to be black, what it means to have systematic racism and how specifically in this industry there needs to be change and what that change looks like. This is healthy. This is a good conversation. We get to ask each other questions because we're not worried about offending each other. We're worried about understanding one another. And that's what I would encourage all of us to try to do is spend less time blaming, less time pointing fingers and more time saying, here's how this works and talk in terms of the day-to-day details. Don't tell us the pie in the sky goal with no tactical things. Like how do we get to where we want to get to? Because frankly, I'm tired of talking about Aunt Jemima and having the brand change every 20 years and like, oh, it's not good enough. Let's figure these things out. Let's find out the tactical things that we have to do to advance the strategic goal that we all want, that we all want. So this is a powerful episode. It's going to challenge you in some ways, but it's also, again, it's a healthy conversation and and we spend a lot of time exploring. So uh, strap it up, get ready. And here comes Hilliard Guest. I love it. These are This is why we do this show is to bring these kind of conversations out so we all can go, yeah, you know what? I've got no problem with anything anybody says. Even if you don't agree with all of it, you can at least hear that there's rational, sane conversation. And one of my favorite parts of the show is I, I say, Hilliard, of all Black Lives Matter, how come we're not talking about Chicago? Like it's the crisis that it is. And he's like, I have the same question. Well, shit, man. Let's, let's advance that conversation. Let's figure out what we need to do as a society to, to help folks out. I've been around the world. I've seen what instability looks like. I've seen what happens when you get hate and animus and ignorance and fear all mixed together into a tribal or a segmented environment. And it ain't good when we got to get going in the right direction. So hopefully this show will be a little piece of that. All right. So here, yes, is coming. Hey, thanks for supporting the show. We love you guys. We appreciate it. Keep on talking. Keep on recommending guests. We want to hear more. And also save the brave, save the brave.org. Take a look, help us out. We'd appreciate it. Here comes Hill. Lions rock productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. What's up, everybody? I'm Hilliard Guest, and you guys are watching the Break It Down show. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, I, I love it. If you guys check out the ticker across the bottom, our reference material is down there. It is long. So uh, if you're interested in reading what we're about to talk about, you can ask me and I will send you a, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes if you're if you're listening later on and if you're watching live, uh, I guess I can direct you some other way. But um, we have Hilliard Gesson, who is a longtime friend of the show. Many years now, Hilliard, we've known each other. Yeah, and man. I always, it's always fun to talk to you and I love you. And it's, I always learn so much from you. Everybody should listen to the screenwriters rant room that you host with a bunch of people. And you guys talk about mm-hmm. screenwriting as a profession. Uh, you guys are always talking about the social conscious aspect of, of how you cast, how you write all these things. And it's yeah. just great. I, I always learn so much from you in so many ways. We are like just 
brothers like we we're both you know mod friendly and we love ska and and you know we grew up in the same time frame in the same geographic area and yet in so many ways we're totally different so i totally I'm, vibe I'm about with to you. hit the big five oh in a few months so yeah we're yeah really i'm already good. there it ain't so bad on this <laughs> side man it ain't so bad yeah, i'm fine i'm not worried about it anymore. but the biggest thing that we're, while we're talking to you today is we all try to sort through you know all of the of the fallout from the george floyd uh murder is, is just understanding race and how it impacts things. You know, it's one, I always like to say, it's one thing to say something like, you know, Black Lives Matter, but like, but you have to act like it, you know, like it's not just say it, it's not just, you know, like put something on your social media, but no shit, where is the work at? Like, where do things need to change? You know, like, look, it's nice and it's, it's kind of adorable that we're like gonna redo Aunt Jemima again, like we did maybe 15 years ago, but like, I don't wanna be in the same spot 15 years from now, re, 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 redoing the Aunt Jemima brand because we still haven't got it right, you know, like what, right. and, and then really like that doesn't move the needle that much. Like, how do we, change things and to that well, end you well, wrote but, something but pete yeah but pete before you get to that just let me just answer that thing right yeah quick. please this is my opinion yeah is that a lot of times these things don't change correctly because there's nobody who looks like me who's helping them do it they just go oh, okay well they don't like it so let's let's straighten her nose yeah <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. let's do little things instead of going what would you guys want well we wouldn't want no do rag on her head. No yada. You know what I mean? We would go there, but they don't ask us. Right. They just do thinking they're doing the right woke thing to do. I, you know I totally I mean? agree, man. And this is just like I talk about in Afghanistan where we're trying to understand and and measure the condition of Afghans and there's not an Afghan in the fucking room when we're doing it. Like, yeah, how do let's do this right. Let's actually yeah. act like we care. Uh let me let me introduce your your guys' open letter because and, and is it Michelle? Amore, is that how she says it? Amore. Yep. Michelle Amore, yourself, and Bianca Sams, you guys are all uh, chairing the uh, WGA's Writers uh, Black Committee, I guess you call it. You guys wrote a letter. Committee, committee of Black Writers. Committee yeah. of Black Writers. And you guys basically write this letter saying, okay, everybody, you've all said that uh, you know you intend to be more woke or whatever it is, right? But, but no shit, you actually have to hire us at a rate that makes some kind of sense. And then also, by the way, just this is an aside, but I know you'll, you'll empathize with this. I'm also tired of reading about professional writers who are full-time writers who are homeless because they don't get paid anywhere near what you need to get paid. So like, okay, let's hire us and pay us well. You know, like, let's see, and not just black folk, just people in general who need a shot, whatever ethnicity or, or culture, you know, ultimately for me, and you know how it was when we grew up, we tried to measure folks on their culture. We tried to get past color, but apparently we're going backwards on that. You know, I, I don't care what's between your legs, how you define it, who you sleep with. Um, I, I don't care, you know, how you take care of your spirituality. I don't care what, what how much melanin you have in your skin. I don't care about those things. Can you do the damn job is what I care about. Yeah. Why have we gotten so far away from all of those things? And then talk to us about your uh, your guys' incredible open letter. Um, I th I think that these times that we're in, like this this the George Floyd and all of these other, you know, like I go down a whole list of ten other people that have you know been pretty much assassinated, if you will, <laughs> you know, in the last you know six months alone. I think like I'm getting a lot of white people hit me. And like, oh, dude, we're so sorry. And like, like all these apologies, like, what can we do? And like all these things. And I'm like, it's, it's just funny that. And, and then people ask me, why do you think this is all happening now? Yeah. And I said, quite frankly, like, you see how it is now. Like, I'm here in Hollywood and like the streets are packed and crowded again. I drive down Melrose. The stores are open, you know, for like 80 percent of the stores are open. Right. You know, a big good percentage of restaurants are open. If this were happening, if Floyd had been killed today, while we're all back to work and back to shopping and everything else, I personally don't believe we would get the support that we have now. Mm. Everybody was at home. Everybody had nothing else to do. And we allowed for, in my opinion, we, it allowed for people to sit and stew and to sit and watch and to, and to sit for that eight minutes and 47 seconds and watch it as opposed to just getting the highlights that you would get because you're on your way to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think so. So a lot of that, you know, younger generation and, you know, there was a lot of, there was, I saw a lot of, you know, white women bringing their, 
you know, 10 year old daughters out there into the marches and stuff, which I think is fucking beautiful anyway. Um, um, but I think if people were at work, we wouldn't have seen that many people. I really don't, you know, and there was a lot of, on Twitter, there was a lot of shaming going on where, you know, y'all, you guys want to help, you know, here's what you should do. Come to the freaking marches, you know, do stuff, whatever. But this is the first time in my lifetime that I've seen this many white folks across America step in and, you know, walk side by side with, you know, every race of people out there in support of this Black Lives Matter thing, you know? And I think a lot of it is just because everybody had time. That's just my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I think the, also just the overall COVID frustration that hangs over all of us. Like we want to get yeah. out, you know, and frankly, I'm tired of seeing the story. It, like look, We're about to next month, we're going to release the Prison Chronicles when we talk a lot about the incarceration I'm looking process. Forward, looking forward to that. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. And one of the things yeah. I've learned is that you know, we arrest and jail way too many people. Like there are so many people we could, let's just say that they are a problem in society. We should and could handle a lot of it externally. It doesn't mean those people don't need to be held accountable, but mm -hmm. we got to arrest less people and, and take the burden off of, off of police. And I'm not a, I'm not a uh, straight up fan of, of defunding the police, but you know, by simply, neither am I. Neither am I. Yeah. By simply yeah. saying, Hey DA, like there's no DA that runs on I'm soft on crime. You know, I want to put less people in jail. Like we have yeah. to, these systems all work together, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's frustrating because I want to do the right things and I want to understand. I also don't want to leave other groups behind either. You know, like um, President Trump just signed legislation trying to direct resources at uh, human trafficking, violence, things that fall between the seams between the, the Native American reservations and the American justice system. And it, it's vital. Like these folks are just left out to dry. And so we're trying to handle a lot of different things in terms of like being uncomfortable and being willing to go out and do something hard like protest. Also, like how do we not just careen on to the next tragedy? And, and you know, it's just we get hit with so many things between global yeah, climate change. I think and that else. One of the things that we've been promoting is like, something as simple as, you know, um, you know, support black businesses, you know, which is a, which is a big thing. You know, we all go, we all go to our regular McDonald's and our regular, you know, um, urban outfitters or whatever you want to call it, you know, to get our stuff. But there are a lot of black owned play. I'm just speaking for black people because that's right. what I am sure. and that's what's going on right now. So if I'm excluding any other race, we're just talking about that. So please know that. So our whole thing is, you know, if you don't, your wallet goes a long way when it helps you know, that cool Ethiopian restaurant down the street, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. As opposed to you going to your local burger place or whatever, you know, all those things make a difference because they, they have, a, they have, you know, 10, 15 people working there, you know? So it, 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 those are ways to help too. You just help businesses, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah. And, and we, and we put out on our, I think even in our letter, they added, and there's like tweets where you can just punch in black businesses and there's literally like hundreds of them show up, you know? So for everything you need and want, there's a business for it, you know? You use words professionally to describe stories and everything. Mm -hmm. what, what is black? What does that mean? Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm hitting you soft and I gentle. <laughs> think I've, I don't think I've ever been asked that before in my entire life. So I'll probably get in trouble for this, and I only mean that in the sense that you know, scholars and, you know, people a lot smarter than me who are black are like, well, why didn't you say this? You know, but I'm just speaking from my soul and from my heart. For me, it's, it's just soul. It's just, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a truth. It's a, it's a feeling. It's a gut. It's a, you know, it's a spirit. It's a, like we all, the majority of us, a lot of us, depending on where we're from and how we're grown up, we always talk about the ancestors. We always talk about like, for example, not to change subjects, um, you know, my 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 representat my representation always like God Hilliard. Every time I turn around, you're writing another historical drama, and I always tell them I'm an old soul. Like I think I, I'm I know I'm from the past. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of my blackness ties into that. You know, even though I have a lot of white in me too, you know, and some Native American in me too. You know, I'm that part of me. I feel within my soul. So when I think of being black, I immediately think of of the soul of being black, 
You know what I mean? Just that that hunger. You got to remember this. When 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 white people say that we're not smart and we're not all these other things, they keep forgetting something very very important. The black people who came across that that Amistad ship, you know, to here, who survived that ship, had to be the strongest motherfuckers in the world. And then they got here and had to survive slavery and have generation and after generation of people. So when I see, when you ask us, for example, like why is it that you know we have the ability to play sports so well and all the, it's in us <laughs> to be agile, you know, to be swift, to be quick, you know, and all these other things. So it's there's there's a reason to me why we're built a certain type of a way because it came down when you ask us what does it mean to be black, you know, it's so in our body you know, to be able to move and to feel the spirit and to be able to, you know what I mean? So, and all that stuff is taken from Africa and, you know, all the other places we come from, you know? So it's, I know I'm jumping, but you get my point. Yeah, well, <laughs> and Matt, I asked you a big, hard question too, but but right. let me continue on that thing. What is the black experience today, like right now? What is it like to be black, you know, internally? Here, here's an example. So, as you know, I've been with my husband who's white very privileged white man, right? I've been with him since 2001. So going on 19 years, right, in October. So for 19 years, we get in the car, like we head to Santa Barbara, we head to Scottsdale, we go to the, to the Bay Area. Every time we drive in the car, I gotta say a prayer that I'm gonna be okay, because this man drives me crazy when he drives, right? He drives like he's got no reason to worry about anything. Yeah. you know. And I and he always thinks it's me trying to control him, you know. Like, oh, you know, you, I'm like, babe, there's no, we're no, we're going on vacation. Why are we rushing? Yeah, you know, he's got the speed and blah 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 blah. And until the George Floyd incident happened, is the first time the two of us in almost 19 years had a deep talk. Mm. And I had to explain to him the anxiety I get when I drive with him, because for him. He's only worried about getting a ticket. I said, you never think about the fact that we actually get pulled over and they go, where's your ID to me? And I'm sitting in the fucking passenger seat. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't even think about that. Yeah. You just go, well, why would they do that? Because yeah. that's what they do to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and so there's lots of little incidents like that that he doesn't think about and hasn't in his in his in the in his uh in the privilege that he's in he just lives life so the things that we're frightened to death of is just a regular thing to you you're just driving in a car fast yeah yeah the fucking ticket <laughs> i'm worried to death that i'm going to get pulled over and this isn't just in the last 10 years since we got cameras on right. my entire life yeah and i got some cool cars as you know i just i drive too. slow yeah you know what i mean because I don't want to get pulled over. Yeah. You know, I let me let me tell you, I go this far. I don't even wear a hoodie anywhere. And I got some badass hoodies. I don't wear not a one of them since what happened was a Trayvon Martin yeah. or whatever. Uh -huh. I don't wear no hoodies. I don't very rarely play rap music. And if I do, I'm playing old school fucking Grandmaster Flash or something. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not playing nothing current that sounds like because people are going to immediately think I'm some drug dealer driving my car. You know what I mean? So I I, I got to switch it all up. I'm only playing reggae. I'm only playing neutral fucking James Brown or something. You know what I mean? I do it intentionally to not draw a certain attention to myself. You know what I mean? Well, that's how we have to think. You play whatever the fuck you want to play. You know? It's not even on your brain that you can get pulled over. You know? I have to worry about where I'm driving in a red car. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah, little, yeah. You know? It's... So, Yeah. Yeah, I mean that is that you are describing the experience of of you know driving while being black. I mean I, I can appreciate that, and I know that on the occasions where I've had someone ask me for my ID while I was sitting in a passenger seat, I, I'm not quick to comply with that. I'm like, what the hell you need? I, I'm not driving, you know. I'm sitting here minding my own right. because I, I'm I'm quick with the wit and the no because you know that's how it yeah, is. Yeah, but you're not worried about it. But see, if I get smart with a cop like that, yeah. oh, they're dragging my ass out the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean. The other thing I do, and I don't know if you do this or not, but I try to act as much as possible and more so now that I'm older and have a calmer, you know, demeanor to me, but I act like someone who doesn't want to get shot 
when I'm in a car. Because look, I have I have my own problem with the police myself. But if I see their hand on their pistol, I slow everything down to a crawl. I'm gonna do whatever you say. You know, I put my finger and my thumb together. I cannot yeah. harm you with my finger. It's my hands like this. Um, and I'm not moving an is that, inch. Is that, a, is, that a, is that a military signal or what is that? No, it's just like I, I can't grab anything aggressively, right? Like I can't, I can't, oh, I can't okay. hurt you if my fingers are like this. So right. I put my hands yeah. high and, and if I see their hand on their gun, I slow down and I'm like, I don't know why your hand's on your gun. I'm not going to cause you any trouble. You're going to go, you know, I have a whole thing I say. I'm going to do whatever you say. But you got to calm down a little bit because, you know, I'm afraid that you're going to harm me now. You know, like we need to get someone else here. And, but I try to, I act like, I, I act like I'm desperate for them to go home at the end of the end of the shift. And I don't know if other folks do that, but I'm watching their hands. They're watching mine and it's a hand watching contest. And, you know, we got to go deliberate and slow when their hands are in a position like, you know, near their gun or whatever. Cause I don't, I don't look, I know it's scary to be in conflict. I've been in conflict. Like you're just acting, you're reacting, you see things that may not be there. And I don't want to put that person in that position, but I don't know that that's a common thing for folks who aren't combat folks. Yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, and I mean, I remember as a, as a, as a kid, you know, it's, 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 remember, I, you know where we come from, both yeah. of us, you know, from the Bay. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I had friends whose parents were, you know, in the freaking Panthers and shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, you grow up with a certain thing. Like I tell everybody, you know, um, not, not changing the subject, but just with like the, the whole Star Spangled Banner thing and all that. Like I knew as a seven-year-old kid what that song meant, you know, because I was taught it, yeah. you know, from other people who knew exactly what it was. So I feel like when you know information, you run it, you roll with power. Here's the irony to all that shit I was just telling you a minute ago about being nervous about driving with my husband in the car is I've been pulled over maybe twice since I've been in LA. Yeah. You know, and guess what they were for? Uh, Having my music up too loud. Oh, okay. Not, not in that car though, which is the irony. <laughs> the two times I've had cops pull up on me on that car, they just rolled up next to me and went, yeah, that's what it's you know, yeah. like cool car. Yeah, you know what I mean. But I'm blasting reggae or something. You know what I mean. So it's just, it's just some. I know I went all off the drill, but yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, I want to get back into your guys's letter because uh, okay, I think this is the like, here. I read the whole thing, and you guys should definitely take a look at it and and what what Hilliard and his peers are talking about, but. You talk about how like Netflix is leading the charge, you know, with, you know, duty to list black members, employees, creators, all that kind of thing. And that all the other, you know, HBO, all the other production houses follow suit. And then you guys say, you know, basically you say, uh, you know, your state, I'm going to read it. Your statements signal your acknowledgement of your public duty to, to inter, uh, integrate the inter entertainment industry reputation and perpetrating racism, both in front of and behind the camera. As your black peers in this industry, because that is truly what you are, we intend to base the validity of your own statements, i.e. we believe you, you know, on how you confront your racist history and honor your commitments to actively replace your racist systems with radically inclusive ones. Whoo. Yeah. Holding them accountable. That's, that's cool. and, it's a mouthful. And, and absolutely going after their integrity. If you're saying this, we believe you. Now we're going to hold you accountable. Expand Here's on that. Deal. Here's the deal. And, and shout out again to Michelle Moore and Bianca um, Sands for that. Um, so you got to understand that. That letter is, let's just call it a hundred years of, you know, pain. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the film industry. You know what I mean? Not, not in the other industries that we're talking about. We're talking about our industry. So <clears throat> that, and it's coming out of, frustration and a little bit of some anger, you know, all that stuff, you know, the George Floyd thing, like the, the protests and the, the, the march and the, you know, people, you know, graffitiing my entire neighborhood, you know, with Black Lives Matter, I mean, it's all, it's so much angst in the, in the world right now. So instead of what we don't want anymore is any more talking, you know, all this bullshit of, you know, oh, you know, we support it too. And then they support it for a week and then they're gone. You know what I mean? What we want is more actual, hands-on, real shit happening. You know, as you see, we said at the end, you know, 
you have your people call my people. You know where we are. <laughs> yes, exactly. You do. <laughs> you feel me? Yes, yeah. We're making a statement. You know what I mean? You know how I am. I ain't got uh-huh. nothing to play. Yeah. And so, so for me, it's just, that's exactly the whole point that I'm trying to say is we, we, that whole statement was coming from now, if this were six months ago, it probably wouldn't have been as heated to be hundred percent with you, but you caught us right after Corona. We call it the Rona, right? Mm-hmm. Right after the Rona. Well, while we're in it, people think it's fucking over. It's not over yet. You know, half the people don't have masks on wherever the hell they go. It drives me crazy. Anyway, um, and and so you're dealing with that, that angst of being at home for the last three months, the angst of, you know, another person has died. Remember the day we put that out, Rashad was killed. You know yeah. what I mean? At, at night. And he, and I don't know if you saw the whole thing. My man was literally going, let me walk to my sister's house. That's the difference between white and black. He still was going to arrest him once he clarified that the, the whatever they call the test said that you are above whatever. He told him before you started, I know I'm probably half past this thing right now. You know, at first he's like, I don't want to take it because it's just going to say that I was drinking. Yeah. Let, why don't you let me park my car? You can watch me park my car. Let me leave it there. Lock the door and I will walk. My sister lives right there. You know what I mean? Any, and, and, and I've had so many people online um, go in about you know, all these white people. When, you know, every time I get put, I remember when I was pulled over and I was drunk, he let me drive home. I remember when I was pulled, they let me take Uber home. You know what I mean? Yada, yada, yada. But my man, he had to arrest him? No. That's the difference. That's the problem. You know what I mean? That we go through is that we always have to worry. And he was being the sweetest dude. He was being kind. He kept his hands here, you know? And he still felt the need to have to arrest this guy. So when you talk about how the, um, um, you know, the incarceration is full of whatever, that's why. Because they're being arrested for things that they could have let him go. You didn't need to arrest him unless they have a quota or something that they have to do. There was no, there was no need to arrest him. Give him a citation or something if you needed to give him something. But let him park the car and let him walk his ass home. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. I mean, you can't let a drunk guy park his car, but, you know, I get what you're saying. Like They did, though. They, they told him to move the car over there, and he did. Yeah, fair enough. The outcome is the problem, right? Like, that's not something that you get killed for. And, and when you get into the Trayvon Martin thing, you know, with him and George Zimmerman, like, it shouldn't escalate to that point. You know, ultimately, neither of them backed off, and one of them ended up dying for it, you know, and... and it's horrible that these can't, things keep happening. Hey, let me ask you a hard question about like Black Lives Matter in general. Uh, again, like if, if we actually care about it, we have to act like it. How come no one's talking about the young kids that are getting shot by other young kids in Chicago and other places like that? Like why, why isn't that part of the narrative? And, and I, I'm asking from a position of openness because I really want to understand. But I don't know. You know. No. I I have the same questions. To okay, be good. Because more more people die by you know gang violence yeah. than by street violence than they do by a cop killing them right to be 100 percent with you so yeah. i mean hey i'm you know you hear al sharpton and those guys go in about this all the time farrakhan has a famous speech that he does about uh gangs and he talks about this, this exact thing that you're talking about about why don't we you know why why don't we get on them <clears throat> you know more black people kill each other than the cops do anyway what the fuck are we doing how come we don't march about that you know what I mean? So it was, hey, we're with you on that 100%. I think that you have to realize that the only thing I can think of, and this is just somebody coming from the hood, like, for example, when I'm sitting in my house, like here or at my office in, the, in West Hollywood, and I hear the helicopter, the ghetto bird go by, yeah. it's just another sound to me. Sometimes we get numb to shit. So all the death, it becomes a way of life to you. You know, when you live outside of it, it's like, well, what about that thing? What about that thing that's going on? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? We're like, I mean, we don't want nobody to die, but that's the risk of living in the hood. You know, it's just another thing. It's bad when the cops come in who are supposed to be taking you and they kill you. You know, that's, that's, I'm not saying the other thing isn't bad at all. It's not what Uh, I mean. Yeah. That's when it be, that's when it makes press. You know, you expect, you know, gangbangers to fight against each other. You know what I mean? I mean, I think it's ridiculous that we do, right. you know, but it's part of the culture. Yeah. You know, if you if if you're part of the street and the street is going to send you to jail and, you know, because you guys just did your prison you know, podcast, yeah. you um, there's hardly any prison you can go to where if you're not part of a color 
or a gang, you know, meaning black, white, or whatever, you will not survive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not not safely. Yeah. You know. So you have to choose, and then you come out of it with that, and you bring it to the street. You know what I mean? All of those people in there are getting out unless they're, you know, in there for death. Yeah. And you even know? then they still get out. We had Matt Ray on the other day. He's one of the guys we feature and he's a white dude, but he right. talked about in his supporting episode, he talked about getting out as a guy who did murder, you know, and, and he yeah. shot two people, killed one of them and did, right. and shot somebody else. And he was saying, like, if you don't run with your race, you still have a problem because right. now your own race is going to come after you. So you're right. You have to, it's the, it's one of the places in society where race truly is a discriminator as to who you can be friends with and 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 what you do. And it's horrible. And and you're right, the whole thing with Chicago or like Shaka, you met Shaka Sangor when I had him on the show. He talks about Detroit and how everybody in his family had been shot at least once, you know, if not multiple times. And then yep. he said that and this is this is where I think we get into the real problem of the system. Um, he talked about how prison was an extension of their community. And that's, mm -hmm. that's not what I want as an American. I don't want like you yeah. to expect that like, yeah, oh, they're just over in prison. Like that's no big deal. And, yeah. and, and, and let me be clear. It's, a, it's since, a badge of honor for some of those people. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it shows that you're hard and you don't care. And, yeah. and Honoré Vachon yeah. talks about that. Like yeah. they teach you to be callous and then punish you for being calloused, you know? And yeah. it's, it's crazy. Um, when we look at these, these part of the problems, I mean, ultimately, and I'm just gonna talk in terms of the numbers, we again we act like we care about black folks dying from the police but we don't talk about the mexican folks the white folks the asian whatever we don't talk intelligently about it and really in terms of numbers if there's 200 million police shifts there's only a very 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 small number of people being killed and it's not predominantly black men does it make any time it's always tragic it's always horrible we need less of those deaths but the problem I think comes in before then, you know, where like you do end up on the hood of a car with your hands behind your back over nothing because of the perception and those problems. I, I just don't know what we I do about I think you just that. hit it on the nail though, Pete. Yeah. What, and I, I know I know the stats because I looked them up myself too. Yeah. There are actually, a lot of people don't know, there's actually more white guys who are killed by the cops than-, than And we don't know a single white. one of their names. Correct. Now, here's what, when, when I read that I went, what did they have to do that was so bad that they were killed though? Yeah. And what's the minutia shit that we did that killed us? Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. There's still a, there's still a gap between why, right? That's still what's missing for me. Not the amount of the why. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that we live in fear of drug on our street and being pulled over where we have to live in fear. I was, I was before I got on here with you, somebody sent me a video of some kids in some neighborhood and it was a really like nice neighborhood with like a fake lake and they had like you know fish in there or whatever and the kids were out there fishing and some you know big white woman of course was like well, i want to she's taking pictures of the car you know and all these things and i want to know you know why are you guys here and the other she's like we live here she's like no you don't <laughs> where where's your house and he's like i don't have to tell you you know what i mean i live here now, apparently yeah. this is the second or third time she's called the cops on them the cops came they took them back to where they live, saw that they live there, and they're out there another day, and she came again. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? She, they're like, why do you keep hassling me? Yeah. She's like, well, you're not supposed to be. He's like, the cops came the other day, <laughs> and they sh they left. So clearly, I live here. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? I don't need to tell you anything. Mind your business. You know what I mean? It turned into that thing, but that's, that's the world we live in. White kids could be out there all day, and they don't even have to fucking live there. Yeah, you know, you know because uh, the color of our skin, she assumes we don't live there. The uh, the one of the things you said, you know, mind your own business. Just in general, as a rule, everybody needs to get some goddamn business and get the hell out of mind. Get your own damn business. You know, <laughs> she was retired, of course. Little Gladys, Gladys Kravitz out there. Yeah, right. But <laughs> right. but really, like if we did mind our own damned business, you know, and and mm -hmm. quit doing it, and and then I, then I was thinking as you were talking. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And and quit doing it. And, and, then, I, and then I was thinking as you were talking, 
you don't see black ladies calling the cop on people in the park for barbecuing and stuff because I guess it's just no. you don't want to borrow that kind of trouble. Well, there's also now I'm not making the assumption all black people live in the hood either, but sure. there's there is there is kind of like and I know you know this from doing your your prison thing. There's 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 politics, right? There's politics in the in the prison. There's politics in the hood, you know, that you can't talk about, you know, and and the same thing with being in the hood, there's politics there. You know, you don't call the cops unless it's detrimental. You know what I mean? You either, remember, now you and I grew up, Pete, when I moved to the hood where we lived when I was seven, six, seven years old, the lady down the street could give me a whipping. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now today, and, that, and also we all were playing in the streets. Car, we all would move. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't see one kid out on the street plan at all mm -hmm. you know what i mean They're all inside with the little video games or whatever the hell they do you know what i mean we we made shit up we were creative as hell because we had we had nothing yeah <laughs> you know what i mean and I so do. there was a different time you know and so 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 the lady down the street wouldn't just call the cops she would come down there and whip your ass in front of everybody the biggest gang banger out there she would whip their butt yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and you were afraid oh don't mess with miss johnson you know what I mean? You were worried about her, then you worried about the the, the homie. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, that, yeah. That's gone. It's gone. You know. One of the things I learned from from my time, you know, talking to folks in combat zones, and this is a bit of a complex issue. So let me just say, there's just two parts to this: is the perception of the problem of insecurity or whatever it was was always much larger than the actual problem itself, and I never really could define why that was. I mean, apart from it being a shitty place and there wasn't much trust. And the other thing was, is as I talked to Iraqis or, or Afghans about their actions when they needed help in general, and, and I'm, I'm kind of associating the hood with, with these places, maybe not as extreme as Afghanistan, but, but maybe more in the case of like Chicago, you know, but um, calling the cops was just not on the list of responses. So here we are trying to build this police force that people will call and they're like, I'll call my mom, I'll call my dad, I'll call my cousin, I'll call my other cousin, I'll call my cousin I hate. I guess I'll just fight by myself. <laughs> they, right. Hilliard, they never said the police. I would say, right. and I would say, but what about the police? And they would laugh in my face. And then I would write my little green notebook, laughed in my face about the police. Wow. So there's these two things where the perception of the danger, like how do we ever get that to deflate to where maybe it is more based on reality? Not that they're not problems, but how do we deflate that monster? And then is does that resonate with you in terms of it, we're not calling the police at all i think it's about approach for me okay you know i mean i know and recall like one of my friends one of my skinhead friends actually traditional skinhead friends was a cop actually in watts oh wow right yeah and uh, danny boy my dude he had an approach when actually he worked in the gang area, as a matter of fact. Okay. But he had an approach with the gangsters where he would talk to them a certain way. You know what I mean? They knew it was okay. For example, you remember the movie, you remember the movie Colors? Yes. Right? Now, Sean Penn and Robert Duvall. So Robert was the older cop. He knew all the gangsters. He knew how to talk to them. Sean was a hothead, young guy coming in, making a ruckus. Right? He would. They would go out, chase after somebody, catch him. And Robert Javal would, in the end, let the guy go. And he's like, why are we letting him go? He's like, we're building relationships. You know what I mean? Now he has, now he owes me a favor. You see what I mean? That's what's missing is instead they just arrest. There's no relationship. There's no, and now that's using, but it is a relationship regardless. You know, it's some trust somewhere that he didn't arrest me. You know, now he owes me a favor and now I owe him one now. You know what I mean, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just about the approach. I think the approach has got to change. Whenever I think of a cop, I think, oh shit, they're gonna come at me in a bad way. So I do everything to avoid being hit, being caught by a cop, even if it means driving slow or not playing a certain music, not wearing a hoodie, not wearing a baseball cap. You know what I mean? All the things that everybody else gets to enjoy. When we look at our problems socially, racially, that kind of thing, we tend to default to black and white. But, but the U.S. is so diverse that we get way past race. I mean, again, you can be a one-legged transsexual person and you can have a job here 
why do we default to black and white so much when there are so many different people doing so many different things with so many different afflictions or, or ethnicities or whatever it is? I think that um, I would say, and I'm not saying this is the answer, just my spitball answer, Yeah, is this in this country, black and white are the two things that you see the most on television. You know, so mm-hmm. it's the first thing that comes to your brain cells, you know, is black and white. And and the majority, I, I think we're the second. I'm not sure. Do you know what the stats are? Is it white than black? I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think in this it, country. It, it, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's I'm not, I, I don't remember. I feel like I've seen it before, but it's been years. Yeah. Um, the sure Latino population is probably the second biggest population in mass. Okay. Okay. But that depends on right. which database you're looking at, too. Right. But then again, as I was talking about TV and film, you also don't see as many, you know, Latinx people either, yeah. you know, yeah. so, so that could cause for the cause, the call of black and white all the time too. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, strong voices are powerful. Mm. So if something happens in our community, you know, you immediately get celebrities like Don Cheadle and these guys, you know, jumping in. So if you have a celebrity face jumping in on a cause, you know, it's going to make it a black and white issue. You know what I mean? And so if if other ethnicities don't use their voices with a celebrity face, then that could be possibly. That's just my, you know what I mean? It could, it could, it could make it more viral yeah. with somebody with a big name. You know what I mean? I, I got a film, there's lots of incidents, incidences that like you're talking about that we just never hear of. Yeah. You know, but there's no real face of it. This... One of the things about the nation that we live in that's wonderful is that literally anybody can outwork their problems. And and let's be honest, like if, when we're going to qualify what problems lay in front of us, we always have to battle the system. We all we, we all do. We have to fight through the the norm of us not being part of the group, right. I mean, whatever group it is. Whether you're writing screenplays or breaking into the NFL as an executive or something, we always have to fight that thing. Is why is it that when we look in, in mass as the U.S., why do black immigrants tend to outperform black folks who are from America? How, how do they manage to get through the injustice that's in the system and, and tend, tend to do well? And we're talking big numbers here. And maybe you don't have an okay. answer to this, but is there no, something? Okay, I have one. Okay, okay good. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Now, now, again, this is touchy area. Yeah. Right? So let me preface that first. And let me just say again, this is Hilliard talking, not for anybody else. Is, for example, my friend Yvonne Orji, who's a big, um, what is that? Oh, he said it's a historical thing, man. Black culture is everything. Been oppressed for too long. That's my buddy, right. my friend, Thank you. Angel, who's a, you, uh, Angel. an emerging um, screenwriter. Awesome. So Trip, my friend Yvonne Orji, who's one of the stars in Insecure, she just did this one woman show called Mama, I Made It, right on HBO. And she talks about how in her culture, the woman has to get married or they have to become a doctor, right? You have to get a PhD. You have to, but that's their culture teaches you that. Our culture doesn't teach us that mm. in America, okay. right? So you're talking culture, not, we're not talking black and white. Remember, a lot of Africans don't even say they're black. They're, right. they're, 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 they're Nigerian. I've had a, I've had a black guy from Trinidad mm-hmm. look me in the face and say, I hate black people. And I go, mm-hmm. wait. And it is total distance, you know, but he, yeah. he's like, I'm not black. Yeah. I'm so from like, Trinidad. I'm Puerto Rican. Right, I'm, exactly. You know, I'm, yeah. Trinidad, I'm, Tr- Trin- yeah. I'm Trinidad, I'm from Trinidad, yeah. I'm from Dominican. Yeah. I'm like, you're black with an accent, actually, you know what I mean? But, you know what I mean? They they have they have taken on that that's what they are. You know, they're Spanish-speaking people. They're yeah. not black. They're, they're just whatever. That's fine. You know, take on what, whatever it is that works for you. You know, it's, I have no problem with that yeah. whatsoever. So anyway, so I think it's a culture thing. So so yes, when they come over here, they come over here with these degrees or they go to the big schools and come out with a big degree, you know? And so as we all know, for example, one of the systemic issues we have in Hollywood is they always say, why don't you get a job at one of the agencies or production companies and work your way up? Well, the, the, the rule in those places, you have to have a BA. Mm. Well, if I just decided at 22, you know, that I want to be, you know, 19 after high school that I want to be in this industry, I can't even be in it because they systemically did that on purpose. There's no reason to be an assistant. You need a freaking degree for it. Sorry. 
You know what I mean? I have two assistants. They don't need it. They didn't need it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's bullshit. You know, but th that's their way of sliding in information, sliding in a, a, a wall there to keep people, the barrier back. You know, it's like back in the 50s and 40s, they kept you from moving in neighborhoods, you know, and the white people are like, well, how come they don't take care of their neighborhood? How come they don't do this? It's like you moved into your neighborhood that was perfect. They gave us the crumb. You try building that whole neighborhood all back again. <laughs> you know what I mean? When nobody has a real job and nobody has a real whatever, you took away Ford and you took, you know, whatever it is, nothing's built up, you know? So there's, there's, there's nothing for people to do. There's nothing, you know, like one of the things, here's, here's something that I always tell my husband. Sometimes we drive through the nice neighborhood. Sometimes we drive through the hood. And I always say, what do you see? Mm. Right. Here's what I see. When I drive through most, most white neighborhoods, I see trees and grass everywhere. Most black neighborhoods or lower uh, income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. hardly any trees, right. hardly any grass. Yeah. Because our priorities aren't about fixing our houses. Our priority is about putting food on the table. You see and what I, I mean? I would imagine too that much like in conflict zones, you also don't want to stand out in your neighborhood as being some having something because that yeah. makes you a target. Because I know that's the case in, like in Afghanistan. We try to bring help and they're like, eh, no thanks. You're going to put me on front street and that gets people killed around here. Yeah. You know, you're just trying to help people. Yeah. But the irony is, you, you, you also have people, I mean, I had a lot of people in my neighborhood, that's for sure. So I'm only speaking for mine, you know, they still living at home and they're 30 years old and they got fucking Mercedes, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they still in the back, in, in the back garage, you know, at mama's house, <laughs> mama's you know what I mean? Yeah. And they drive in a $50,000 car, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So uh, sometimes your priorities just aren't there, you know? And that to me is a difference between why some African countries in particular are, far more advanced than we are, their culture teaches them to go to school and become a doctor, for example, or a lawyer, you know, something where they're going to have a PhD or some high level, you know, degree that's going to allow for them to get a job where they're making a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year where they can live in a white neighborhood, you know, and be the only black person in the neighborhood. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where, whereas, whereas a lot of us have to come up through the, the regular system of either if, if you make it, you're an athlete, you're a rapper, you're a performer, you know, or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you're right about the, the cultural thing. And you know, one of the biggest uh, problems socially when, when you, you know, cause social problems are multivariate problems. So you have to account for a lot of different things to determine like what's right. really happening. And one of the biggest things is, can you, can you find a dad in the house? And if you have a dad in the house, a lot of the gaps between black and white, Asian and white, a lot of them shrink up substantially. And not completely, but it's a big factor in having that male role model in the house that demands that kid, you know, go to school, graduate, think bigger, you know, whatever that thing is, it just provides that extra layer of stability that, you know, that's another problem well, that would be great to solve, you know? I, th I think you're, I think there's some truth to that. I mean, like I grew up in a neighborhood, you know, East Palo Alto, East Menlo, where now this is just me speaking. So I, I know I've prefaced that a lot because I have to be really careful. This is touchy stuff. Like, well, why did you, you yeah. know what I mean? It, it's really. So for me, I remember being 12 years old and being the only person I knew who had his mom and dad. I didn't know anybody that I knew who had their mother, and that I could remember at least, who were my age, who were in school, who had their mom and their dad living in, I don't remember. There might've been, so forgive me if I, if I skipped you, but I don't remember you, right. right? And so my house was always that hub where my parents were the parents to a lot of people in the neighborhood. We were the hub to go to. My mom was the candy man, the candy woman. You know, she made candy apples and shit. Yeah. And you know what I mean? So it was that house. You need to have anything for Thanksgiving, come to the guest's house. You know what I mean? So it was that place where we were. So I always remember there's lots of things that kept me from, you know, um, yes, I was part of, you know, a gang when I was a kid, but it was a different time. You know, we weren't, it wasn't the way it is now. We were much more of a breakdance crew than we were out there repping for a set. It wasn't that at all. You know what I mean? If anything, we were, we were perpetrating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were straight up faking it. You know what I mean? So I'll keep it real with you. So. Anyway, where I'm going with all that is that um, where you're, you're talking about having that father figure in the house, 
I, I mean, I could think of a lot of black women who are just as strong as the man would be. Of course. So I wouldn't say that you need you need the father figure in the house. Um, because I've I know and seen a lot of strong people grow without their 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 father in the house. Um, because you could just as well have a father who's an asshole too. So yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um so a lot of, I I don't think that's the right thing to say personally, but I would say it's it not meant depends. to be a perfect solution. It's just when they're both right. there, people tend mm-hmm. to do better. And look, raising kids is a two person job, you know, to, to mm-hmm. try to get everything done. And God bless single moms. Holy shit. I don't know how they do it, but you know, they, they do it. It just, it also tends to work out less well when the dad is not around. I was going to ask you too, because if a memory serves, you didn't graduate high school, like in the traditional mm-hmm. fashion. Does that have anything no. to do with like your cultural upbringing or was that just because no. you're a knucklehead? That was, no, that was, that was me. <laughs> you know, I'm going I'm to be honest with you. So what happened was I was not going to school, right? And um, I was doing um, commercials and stuff and thinking I was doing fine with my money I was making and, you know, doing odd jobs here and all that. And I was like, why am I going to school? Yeah. You know, so I didn't. The only thing I went to class for was history, duh, uh-huh. right? I went to drama and I went to, excuse me, I went to dance class. All my last three classes. Yeah. That's all I went to. Well, it, and it, English, English if we had a test. Yeah. I like to be challenged. I like to write something. Yeah. But I had no idea that that was going to be my life later on, you know? From talking to the guys in the Prison Chronicles, especially the black guys, you know, who did the inner city gang thing they talk about how exceptional it was to get out of the hood because it just, it wasn't a known path. I know like when I, when I went to school, I wasn't the first person in my family to get a college degree, but no one was offering a lot of advice, but the college degree was the accepted, you know, next step. Like you're going to go to college. Of course it wasn't pressurized. It was just normalized. But I think that when we look at neighborhoods that don't do as well, we don't have that next step. And so it takes exceptional people or exceptional circumstances to get someone on that path to to even believe that it's possible. That's the other thing I found out too in conflict zones is young men have their hopes and ripped out of them early on and they become callous to the world because no one cares about them. And if we act right. like that, then they believe us. And you have to remember in, in a lot of the lower income areas, sometimes the kids are the first of their generation to graduate and get their diplomas or to get yeah. their unit you know, to go the first to go to college, the first to graduate high school. Right. You know, there's a lot of those those things where in most white neighborhoods, you know, they've already been to college, they've already bought homes and cars and you know what I mean? And you're the first person ever in your family to do that. <clears throat> so you have to also like, I was just giving notes to um, this group of writers um, before we got on the call. Um, and they were, they were all pitching to me the projects that they were ready to go out with. And I was giving notes to one of them, who's this former teacher, who's writing this, he's a white guy, probably in his 50s or 60s, and he's writing the story of this kind of lower own area. And I'm like, why are you writing the story? And then he told me the story about being a teacher, like in South Central. I was yeah. like, what? You know, then I leaned in. Yes. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why didn't you start with that? Oh, I didn't feel like anybody wanted to know. I was like, whoa, no, 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 no. That goes against the Hilliard you School of Pitching. With- exactly. I was like, now you got me. Now, and said, I said, you have to remember, we're in a climate now where everybody's like, don't, white men, stop writing our fucking characters. Yeah. We can do it, right? We're in that climate right now, especially now, right? Where a lot of people feel that. I, don't, I can't say I feel that 100%. I'm like, if you can nail the nuance of the story and nobody black is in the midst of writing it, fucking write it, right? That's how I feel about it. Okay. But get the nuance right, right? Now, and I said to him, I was like, you as a white guy over 50 especially have to lean in on why you're the expert on this. Because now I can't sit here and go, well, what does this white guy over 50 know about these yeah. inner city kids? Now I'm like, oh, he was a teacher for 10 years in one. Of course he knows about these kids. You know, yeah. He's the one responsible for some of them graduating high school. Of course he knows. Let me know that he was like, oh my God. I was like, yeah, what do you, <laughs> never, never hide the thing you, that you think is weak. The yeah. thing you think is weak, lean in on it. That's what I learned. I want to ask. You know who talked about? Mick Bettencourt. Mick Bettencourt is awesome. Yes. And we're going to have him on the show again soon, too. I'm super stoked about that. And I want Mm -hmm. you to co-host. 
But uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about along those lines, and I, I believe I already know your answer because we've talked a lot about this, but black <clears throat> folks, you know, should should be the primary writers of black roles and in, in black situations. Like if you work on blackish, you know, there should be black people in the room in that writer's room. Well, but, on that one, it is. <laughs> yeah, right. On that one, it is, <laughs> right? You on that right. And yeah. that's why it feels different when you watch it. Right. But exactly. why is it okay for black folks to white to write white roles? And I know you've you've oh. already told me what you thought, but yes, please. Yeah, go. I like this one. All <laughs> right. So boom. All right. Hollywood. Pay attention to this one. Y'all about to get some game. All right. So trip. <laughs> Here's the deal. So I was just telling somebody yesterday when I went to my big four agent that I was with before we had to let them go, I'm sitting at the conference table with all these agents and I said this. I said, before I left, I said, do me a favor. I know you guys want me. I know, you, I, I know this is the right place for me. I says, but know this. Put me up for everything that you think I can really write. I have a sample for almost all of them, right? I said, if all I hear are you calling me for black roles or for black stuff or black stories, I'm walking out. I literally said that. Yeah. I'm walking out. I says... Here's the difference between me and all the other white writers you have. I live in a white world and I live in a black world. They don't live in mine. Right? So to assume that we can't write you, to assume because, oh, all, everybody on the cast is white, so we don't need a black writer, you, you, you've lost your whole sense of, of what we're talking about. You need one of us in the room because you need some more nuance. You need some more flavor. You need something different. You need a different point of view. And that, that means, and I'm not just talking about black, I mean everybody, whatever it is, you, you know what I mean? <clears throat> because, and I don't mean just one, you know? That's the other problem is, sure, you have a TV show, your number two is a black woman on the show, right? So you as the white showrunner go, well, we need a black, you know, female writer in the room, and you bring in some staff writer on the show who you give no voice to. So she has to be speaking up for everything, but she has no power. So she could say, well, I'm not sure that we should say that. It's kind of uncomfortable. Well, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. You know what I mean? I don't think it's, yes, it can't be that bad. They can overpower you like that. You need a high level black writer to go, no, bitch, no. We're not doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the difference. So to, to answer your story, to answer your question, yes, we can write them. Because we live in the world. It's hard for them to write us because they don't live in ours. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. I love it. I love that we got the chance to get down these things. And these aren't easy conversations, by the way, for everybody. Hilliard, you know, is just speaking straight from the heart. And so I, I appreciate your candor. Let's talk a little bit more about the industry, you know, Netflix yeah. at all. And, and I know we didn't they... talk about this statement very much either, but yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but let's, yeah, let's get into that. Like, what do we expect? I mean, what, what do you, what do you want to see from these folks? Is it like the NFL where they have to interview, you know, a black person for every job or. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm going to shut that's, up. That's Tell me what you want to see. That's, that's exactly what I would love to see. I would love to see a real Rooney rule. It was Rooney rule. Rooney rule. Yeah, Rooney rule. Yeah. Seven place. I can't say that. Seven Rooney place, rule. Not just for writers, for directors, for, you know, uh, sorry, he's writing questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah. He wrote, uh, it's easily conceptualized the white supremacist militia, and it's actually pretty fun to aim for accuracy. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, um, yes, we would love to have a Rooney rule for all kind of, you know, different departments in the industry. You know, in the front and in back of the camera, you should have to interview, you know, people of color for those positions, you know, because what happens is you saw what happened was it last year, the year before they had all those black co coaches in the NFL. Now they got rid of 90, 10, 90 percent of them. But, you know what I mean? At least they had a moment. Yeah. You know, the problem is here's the other problem. You put them in there, but you don't give them a chance to fail. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I mean? Oh, see, we told you we we were three and ten last year because we brought in a black guy. The year before, yeah. we were seven and five. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. So as soon as you brought in a black guy, we didn't do great. It's like give him a chance to fail. You yeah. give the white guy seven chances to fail. You know what I mean? That's the problem. So the writers, for example, just talking about that because that's what I do. They get on a show and they get one try. You know. So what we're doing instead of being a, like well, a lot of people are going. Um, getting getting the offers to be able to run some of their shows sometimes, right? <clears throat> what we don't want to do is get caught up when you're not ready to run your show because they'll be the first people to be like, see, we gave a black person their chance yeah. and they weren't ready. You know what I mean? 
And we watch a lot of these young right writers get these chances and they fuck up and like, well, maybe let's bring somebody else in to help them. You know, instead of us, they just cut us off. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Instead of giving you a chance to to really hone your skills, you know, to become whatever. So to me, it's it, it plays in all those different ways is, is allow us to grow just as much as you would anyone else. You know, let us fall. Let us, you know, and let us get back up. You know, that's how you learn. You can't really teach people how to show up. You know what I mean? It, it, you got to be a great manager in so many different ways, you know? And the only way to learn that is to, to do it, you know? You, we have like the showrunners program and a, there's a couple things you're going to get, but you're going to get out there on that field and it's going to be different, you know, because every show's different, you know? So did I answer your question? I, I think so, yeah. I think so. I, you know me, I'll be going off. No, so. but what you're saying <laughs> is right and Angel is definitely enjoying it. Uh, let me ask you another challenging question with that then. Uh, what does it look like from the other end? Like, let's say that I want to go be a showrunner and I've, you know, worked my way into a writer's room. They're going to let me start, you know, baby producing and everything. And I, I do, I drop the ball and I, I screw it up. You know, do I get another chance? How long does it take? What does that look like? I, I would, I think it depends on how bad of a thing you mess up, first of all. Yeah. Um, but, but it looks like this. So say, Pete, say you wrote a show. Say you created a show, right? You sold it to Sony, right? Sony loves it. They want to pick it up. They give you a deal. Um, and um, they're going to rush right into production, right? Now, this should never happens, by the way. But I'm just scenario time, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's June right now. You guys are going to be shooting by the end of the year, right? So you got to... Let's assume you've already written the script. Let's say they bought the script. You probably got to go and develop a couple little things for them, make a couple changes. You know, so by by the end of the summer, you'll have your next draft. You know, they're already talking to a director. You know, they probably paired you with a showrunner who's going to actually run the show. You'll probably be the co-EP, you know, working, uh, uh, co-producing the show with him or her. Right. And, um, and say you guys are going to shoot the thing in... October, so that you can be ready for pilot season when everything's dropped. Gotcha. Right? Okay. They're gonna get. They're gonna bring to you a showrunner. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of people assume that they're just gonna give you a showrunner, right? What they usually do is go. Here's a list of showrunners, and you pick through them. You meet with them. You read their scripts. You see who's who. You see who has the voice that you like. You sit down with them. You know, you get you get to pick two. Yeah. You have a voice. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, they just put you with, no, that's not, they're not going to do that. I mean, sometimes they have a deal with a certain person they're going to push your way, of course, you know, but it's usually somebody that probably does fit you pretty well. You know what I mean? Um, So they're, they're pretty smart about that. They know exactly what they're doing for the most part. The problem is is that list is usually white guy over 50, Mm. you know, nine times out of 10 for every showrunner spot, you know? And so and and because of what we were talking about earlier how you get the young black writers you know male and female who are getting on staff but staying as a staff writer for four or five years you know every new show they're on they won't bump them up they just keep oh well, all we have is enough money for this so if you really want the job you know what i mean you got to take it yeah you're like i was a staff writer three years ago yeah. why am i still a staff writer you know what i mean yeah and so you wonder why people haven't moved up you know because they don't get the same opportunities that the white guy gets. You know what I mean? That's exactly, so you have this systemic thing in the way that keeps hitting a wall for you, Mm. you know? So a lot of us are trying to create our own thing. And that's, you know, that's why I've stayed in the indie world for so long because nobody could tell me anything. I can be in charge, you know what I mean? And I I make great product, you know what I mean? And so, and so, and I can make a decent living out of it. It's not the living I'd make if I was in, you know, the big system. You know, we all know that, right. you know, that's why, that's why I teeter between both of them. Yeah. I make a little bit of money over here and then I make big money over there. Yeah. And I make a little money here and I make, you know what I mean? But, but, but it's put me in a position now where I'm sta- on staff on a show two years ago and now I'm able to be a co-EP on a show, you know, because that little thing got me into, oh, he's on the list now. Right. Right. So now all of my producing stuff I've done, people go, oh, I see. Yeah, he can handle this. You know what I mean? Yeah, Despite this, he hasn't done 10 other shows. 
this goes to that thing that I was saying earlier, like where you literally can outwork your problem. Like nobody's allowed into the big system. I mean, okay, yeah. some people are legacy then, but for the most part, you have to get lucky, trick people, whatever it is. And but you can always go out and create your own things. And if you show that you're a good bet, it just no. All of a sudden, if you're able to gather an audience and make money, no one cares what color you are. It's like that. Yeah, you make money for people. I want you to make money for me. But let me ask you this. In, in two different ways. Um, what does the black community owe itself, whether it's in film or in general? And then this is not in any way abnormal for any race or ethnicity, but there does seem to be a, uh, I'll call it jealousy for lack of a better term, you know, calling calling a successful black person an Uncle Tom or, or seeing if they're really just white or whatever it is. There tends to be a clawing back to, to, you know, to mediocrity that, that the group tends to do to each other. And again, I know every group does that, but it just stands out. Like I had a, a friend of mine said that, you know, a, a very smart and credentialed black teacher uh, was white explaining something. And it's like, how dare you say that? Like this guy has done his work and he may not agree with you politically, but, but don't undermine his credentials because that's, you know, that's not good. So talk about how, what does the black community owe itself? Hmm. I don't know if I could really answer that question. Um, that's that's above my pay grade, to be 100% with you. No, I'm being 100% yeah. with you right now. Um, it, well, is it a hard question? Yeah, it's a very hard question. Well, let me ask you this. What is what is the white, what do, what do they owe each themselves? Maybe that'll help me. Well, we, you know, we got to listen and, and we got to be uh, tolerant and let folks figure out what they're trying to figure out. Like if you're struggling to a, you know answer that question, um, you know, we need to allow time for that. You know, in general, we all listen, we all need to be more tolerant in general. You know, like it's easy to dismiss somebody to look at a picture or a meme and say, this person is this. I wouldn't dare to characterize you even in 25 words. Like if you were to God, you know, God forbid, like die in some way. And I wrote about your life. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't do it in a hundred words. How in the world can I look at a picture and determine who you are and assign you things? So we have to do way less of that in general. Um, so I would say the white community owes itself tolerance, patience, time, and, and some understanding. And if you don't have those things, that's where you work. Then you work on tolerance, patience, time, and understanding. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can, how to answer this question, to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I'm short of words. Me, <laughs> you know me too. Me? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. It's such a big one that. Yeah. And I, and I, I think the pause is I worry who's listening mm. and they interpret that what I said is, oh, well, a black guy said, so that must be, you know yeah. what I mean? And so I feel like I'd rather skip that question. Well, okay. Well, let's do that then. And, and then but, I'll. But, but yeah. I would rather go back to the other thing you were talking about though. And I forget what it was. You well, clawing back to mediocrity, like that person's no, an uncle. No, Tom. No. It, oh. Yes. Yes. Let me talk about that. Yeah. So that is definitely a systemic thing. I think that personally comes from slavery. That's just my opinion. Okay. I think it goes, it goes back to that, you know, um, the light skin, dark skin, blacks, the light skin, blacks were inside the house you know, being the maids and the butlers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you had, you know, the dark skinned blood blacks were out on the field doing all the hard labor work. So they battled with each other. You know, the light skinned blacks were prettier sort to the man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They were, a lot of them were, you know, their, their mothers were raped by the, by the, by the master. So that's how they became light skinned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They had the prettier hair. So you, it goes back systemically even for us you know with with the with the color of your skin being a thing if you think about it the 80s 70s 80s and 90s were mostly full of light-skinned black people hmm. you know what i mean for the most part okay. i think eddie murphy was a little dark but you get my point yeah um but he was a handsome guy right and so all all the way until like the last i want to say eight to 10 years are we starting to see real, I call them real looking people. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is, for example, on my show on Deadly Class, one of the characters was, did, he was supposed to be like this part of this gang, right? Well, they all were parts of the gang. Yeah, right. Um, and he's supposed to have a girlfriend and they, they decided they wanted to make her black because he was a black guy. And I said in the room, I, I have one thing to say. And they said, what? I said, she needs to be a dark skinned sister with like dookie braids in her hair. Uh -huh. And they were like, 
oh, we could never do that. And I was like, yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And they were like, they were like surprised. I was like, a dude like this, who's supposed to represent a gang from South Central, would have an around the way system. Yeah. You know. Now, in the end, they hired a girl from I don't know where. You know, she did a decent job. She looked the part, but she didn't have the, you know what I mean? She uh-huh. didn't have the hood flavor that I wanted, but that wasn't the girl that they were looking for. Yeah. You know, yeah. which is fine, which is fine. But she at least looked the part, yeah. you know, because usually they make a, they hire some mulatto girl, you know, to play, you know, whatever. And I'm, that's not real to me. So, so I know I jumped on that, but the whole point I was trying to use that was to say that that systemic way of casting like every time you see a tv show and you have a whole for the most part you see like anything on the cw and they have a black girl she's always like is she black i can't like you know what i mean <laughs> you always have to like double take to look at uh-huh. her to tell if she's black, you know what i mean they all have straight hair they're you know whatever it is so, so there's no sisters in there you know what i mean there's no real thick sisters with the way we look you know what I mean? That's where we're going now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. our real people that we see, not just your Hollywood version of, oh, we, we got somebody black in here. You know what I mean? And they are not representing us the way that. See, I'm going to be careful about this because it's some real shit. But I mean, <laughs> it, it takes real shit conversations to get through these right. things. You know, I mean, we, we have to be able to have the conversation so we can learn. If you could at the WGA or within the industry, turn one dial and correct one thing to get after this. And so that five years from now, we're having a different conversation. Mm-hmm. What would that mm-hmm. one dial be and, and how far would you twist it? It would be that we'd hire more. Now I'm just talking to black. I'm not talking about. Fair enough. All right. And the reason I say that is because, for example, when we put out that letter, right, one of the responses we got from um, our people was that our stats were off, right? We said 80% of white people, this, and, you know, 5% of black people, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, actually it's more like, you know, this and this. We're like, no, it's not. They're like, well, you know, it's actually this many because of people of color, blah, blah, blah. We were like, whoa, 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 whoa. About we're not color. talking about people of color. Right. We're talking about black. And they were like, oh, you know what I mean? They immediately put us in the pocket yeah. because the pie, the pie looks better to show the stats. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That the stats are actually here. I'm like, no, bitch, just black. Right. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. That's why we went through that whole little thing. Black people, this and the black. Black people, but we did that on purpose. So we put it in your head. We're not talking about people of color. We're talking about black people right now. Right. If there was one thing that I would do is I'd get more black people where they are executives who can green light. Right. I say that because you're going to give me an executive who's just a person who's just in the room sitting there. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you're at the table talking and we're just sitting there, you know, I'm just sitting there as, as the voice. I'm like, see, we got somebody black here. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they didn't even fucking speak. No, I want them to have a voice to say, you know what guys, we should do this movie. That's what we need. Right. We need, we need that. And in, in the, in the executives that's for studios and networks. And that goes the same with agencies. We need more black agencies, more black agents and black agencies. You know, it's super important because you, you, you walk, when I walked into the agency that I was with, I must have passed 10 rooms before I saw somebody of color. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. My agent is white. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. My new manager, Rashidi, he's black. Thank God. You know what I mean? But, but yeah, I mean, that's literally how it is. You, you, for every one of us, there's, 50 of them, you know, in these, in these companies. And that's, and most of them don't have any authority, you know? So you, you're make you're just passing a quota. And it's the same thing in the writer's room. You're, you're bringing us into the room, but we have no say, you know, if you're just hiring staff writers in a room, they have no say, you know, no matter how many showrunners will tell you, Oh no, in my room, everybody can speak. But in the end, who has the final voice? Yeah. Yeah. You, you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and your final voice might be against something that the black person was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean? that, but if it, well, that resonates with me. It, Sorry, jump on you. That, that resonates with me a little bit because, 
Yeah, it's it's same kind of thing's true with veterans. You know, like if we're going to try to make a, a you know a bit of a, an analogy or, or comparison, you know, you go and you serve your country, you get multiple degrees, you've done all these incredible things, managed multi million dollar budgets, and they're like, how about an entry level position at this corporation? And you're like, motherfucker, I've managed, you know, 50 people, billions of dollars of stuff in an area where people were trying to shoot me. You could have paid me 35 grand a year to do like, you know, I'm a stallion. I'm not a pony, you know, and I, <laughs> dude, I mean, it, it happened to me in the corporate world. Like they couldn't, they couldn't put me to work in a way that made any sense. And then also, I mean, to, to my credit, they would say you're overqualified. Like they could see that I was there. You guys aren't getting that benefit of the doubt. Like wow, holy shit, we're lucky to get this guy, you know? So we've got to definitely... Because we, we have to overprove ourselves. Right, you right. Know? They think, oh, he must be the diversity hire. Oh, she must be the diversity hire. Now, the diversity hire, in case you don't know, is the studio or the network is paying for that writer to come into the room so that you don't have to pay out of your budget so that you can have a person of color in the room. Right. You know what I mean? It's forcing that you know, that, that, that thing. So yeah. all the writers are sitting at the table going, well, this person probably can't even write. I mean, I don't know how the hell they got here anyway, but they forget most of those people who are diversity to hire got there because they won over 6,000 people to get into the diversity program. They got them there in the first place. Right. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So you had written something fucking amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I've hammered away at you with some really hard questions on some really hard topics. I want to, do you want to ask me anything to even the scale a little bit? I, I don't know if there's anything I want to ask you, but I just want to say that, you know, just want to reiterate again <clears throat> that that dear Hollywood statement that we put out um, again, Michelle, Michelle Amore and Bianca Sams um, was really, like I said, it just came out of the time that we're in, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and and coming straight out of this, I keep coming saying straight out of like we're done. But while we're living in this Rona time, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There was a lot of facets and a lot of angst and a lot of anger at that that letter that we just we just talked from the heart. You know what I mean? That was that was something we had to do. So I hope everybody takes a moment, you know, five, ten minutes, whatever it takes to read it, and you'll really get into the head of, you know, what's going on in Hollywood from a black person's point of view for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's an important thing because it's one th it's one thing to and I always say the word complain. It's unfair. I just put the link to the um, to the thing you guys wrote in the show notes already, but the the ability for you guys to speak for your industry and it's an important industry because how you guys go, we all go. You know, yeah. it's as you you guys in Hollywood. I mean, by you guys, you guys guide how really a lot of the world shapes itself. And to well, have... we, we run Twitter. Black people run Twitter. People don't know that. <laughs> you know what I mean? We <laughs> I cause a ruckus that. on Twitter and Twitter will fucking crumble. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm not a black women in particular. Oh, yeah. They run Twitter. See, run there Twitter. you go. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. But, yeah. but for you guys to speak out for your industry and to hold them accountable to their promise that they have, hopefully we can move forward on these things. And we need more black leaders from different industries to do the same thing. Like, okay, you guys are all ready for action. Like you said, let's not just redo, you know, Aunt Jemima and then redo, redo, redo. Like it's not about the brand. Like it's about getting the people in the room that can help you get this closer to right. Because right. the last thing I want to do is buy a pancake brand that's offensive to somebody. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm not trying to take offense or give it, you know, I, but, but we got to act like we actually care about that shit, you know? Right. Uh, one, one last thing I wanted to talk about was Please. the, um, I know we got to wrap up. I was just, so, so somebody approached me the other day about talking to somebody from one of the, it was like a Black Lives Matter type of place and how they wanted to defund the police, you know, but they wanted to defund the police from movie sets. Mm. And I was like, movie sets? They were like, yeah. And I was like, and they want to talk to me? They're like, well, yeah, because of your statement you put out. I went, they don't want to talk to me. And they were like, why? And I was like, because I'm not the dude who's like, let's defund the police about that. Yeah. Right. And I said, here's why. Now, I'm probably going to get some slack from this, but I don't care. So I said, here's the example that I'm going to give you. Now, I'm somebody who shoots in the indie world a lot. Right. So you got to hire cops to, you know, to secure you. We might be shooting in the hood. Who is going to be your security? You ain't just going to hire some flashlight cop. Yeah. You need a real, a cop. real cop. You're going to be in South Central and Watts or whatever, wherever you're shooting, 
you need some real Chicago. You need to be in the room where it happens. You need to be in the real spot. You know what I mean? And you need real cops so they can be like, oh, shit, we ain't going up that street today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You need a real. So I'm like, keep the cops from coming to the. Mm, I don't know about that one. You know, so for me, I'm like, uh, I don't know if I totally agree with that. Defund the police for that reason. Your other reasons is your thing, but for my reasons for not not with the movies and stuff, no, not not with that. Well, I mean, you need a professional grade thing for what you guys are doing because you're doing professional grade work. You can't have people exactly. taking off with lights or interrupting a shot. I mean, how how expensive is a is a you know quick two minute scene that you have to shoot, dude? dude. Dude, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, it's crazy. Depending on the on the on the moment. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And you can't have people screwing that up. That's why you need real security there. And you're right. Like, you need real security. we can hold the police accountable. I know the police are holding themselves accountable, and we need good people to want to be that way. Like, we got to treat police how we'd want to be treated. They have an impossible job. You know, all the different things they have to do. We've got to keep sight of that while we still say, "Hey, we expect more from you." You know. Bill, Bill Maher said something the other day that I thought was the best thing. He said, cops, and I wonder how you feel about this. Now, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm not saying it the way he said it. He said something about, like, cops should be like airplane pilots. Hmm. Like, you can't make a mistake. You know what I mean? Yeah. They have airplane pilots could lose the entire, you know, uh, uh, flight. Everybody could die. Cops have guns and could kill somebody. It should be the exact same, you know, you know, the, the, the test that they put the, through your eyes have to be perfect. You know, all the yeah. cops should be the same way. I was like, damn, like it was just bars. I was like, mm, that's pretty fucking fast. Like somebody who has the right to kill you should have to be vetted majorly. You know what I mean? I thought that was pretty smart because what we're hearing um, right now in the black community is a lot of, especially in the last five years, the, the Klan and all these different um, white supremacy groups are moving into the cops, you know, and trying to take that over. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so so I'm, that's why we're not surprised that these things are happening. You know what I mean? They come after you. They're looking for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, my man had his, had his, had his, had his hands in his pocket. While the camera was on, he's not even worried about anything happening to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those are the type of things that I'm saying. Even the cop with um with uh, Rashad the other night, you know, when this all happened, he the the camera was right on him. He didn't care. Yeah. And he was being really nice. So I, I just assumed he was gonna let him go. The way he was talking to him. And the, the problem is, like my husband said, well, why did he why did he have to run? And I said, Did you see that he he was pissed? You yeah. know what I mean? He had he played him the whole time, like as if everything's good, dude. Let me just check this thing. And then as soon as he checked it, he went, you know, nah, give me your hand, dude. After yeah. the whole, you know, he was like, You playing me. So he tried to run. You know what I mean? And, and and he was like, he was like, Well, I don't think he needed to run. I said, that's the difference between us. I said, I can't tell you that I wouldn't have ran either, because I was fucked up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, I know I'm jumping. Yeah, no, but it, but it's it's a good conversation, and I guess I would add one more thing too. If we're going to talk about defund the police, maybe it's refund the police, like change how we do it. In terms of if we want them to, have, everybody always says, "Oh, they should have better training." Well, that shit that's expensive. You got to have a twenty percent quarter of your force off duty and focused on training all the time to get that level of of training, and that means you know that's expensive. Well, what do you guys do for the military? I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, the guys gotta be the guys that spend the most money on training and being ready are the SEALs and, and the special forces. And those guys are way more expensive per person to build than the standard big army person. So if we want a higher quality of officer, we all have to say we're desperate to spend more money on taxes on our police so that they can, you know, we can have way less of these outcomes. And I don't hear us saying that. I know, but I'm just wondering if, if, is there a way to, um, um, well, uh, this is what I was thinking is, so if you get rid of the cops, which I don't think they should do, by the way, right. let's just be clear about that. They should, that means if we don't have cops, whoever's coming is way worse than that. Yeah. 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 You feel me? Yeah. Whoever's coming is way worse than that. Imagine if the seals were out there. Now, I'm not, now they're, they're a lot smarter than you, but they would, nobody would have a chance. Yeah. 
against, you know, Seals and shit. Like, you would have no chance whatsoever yeah. against any of those guys. They're actually really good with weapons. Cops are, are sort real, of shaky. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. But I guess I would also say, too, though, that those guys have a higher tolerance for the uncertainty. They don't get afraid as much because they've been in Correct. terrifying situations. But, it, listen, I've had you for an hour and 20 minutes, and it, like, it, it's always wonder. I wish we could do these things face-to-face, but, you know, the Rona has got us locked up, <laughs> but man, I, I love it. I love talking with you. I love being pushed on my, on my social well being because this is how we all grow is by having these hard conversations and not being afraid to, you know, to, to put it out there. Like what, what do we really need to do? Like, how do we actually act like we care? And you've given us a great lay down on that. God, I hope I didn't offend anybody out there. You know, they'll get over it at the same time. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They will get over it. They can take it. I promise. Yeah. We can all take some heavy. Any good idea can withstand a whole lot of rigor. And if it can't, then it ain't a good idea. Go back to the drawing board. So it's just like a script, man. A script that can't take on good notes. Any good script. Yeah.